And we start with Decision 2024 and continuing our interviews with candidates in an Arizona congressional race being watched nationwide. The Valley's Republican-held 1st Congressional District is a toss-up. If a Democrat flips the seat, it could help the party take back control of the House of Representatives. Here's a snapshot of the 1st Congressional District. It's one of Arizona's wealthiest districts, taking in Scottsdale, Paradise Valley, Fountain Hills, and a slice of Central Phoenix. Seven-term Congressman David Schweikert won the district by less than a percentage point in 2022. The district's voters swung Democratic after Donald Trump's election in 2016. Democrats at the top of the ticket, Kirsten Sinema, when she was still a Democrat, Joe Biden, Mark Kelly, and Katie Hobbs have all won the vote there. The Democratic primary is packed, a six-person field. Here they are, Andre Cherney, a former congressional candidate and former head of the state Democratic Party, Marlene Galan-Woods, a former broadcast journalist, orthodontist Andrew Horn, Kurt Cromer, a former Red Cross executive, Connor O'Callaghan, a Wall Street executive, and State Representative Ami Shah, an emergency room doctor. Joining us now is Connor O'Callaghan, first-time candidate for office in the 1st District. Welcome to Square Off. Thank you for having me, Bram. You're a newcomer to politics. Uh, the question we ask everyone, what separates you from your five rivals? Well, Bram, it's great to be here. Thanks again for having me on. So this race is deeply personal to me. So I moved to America as a baby. I was born in Ireland, and I moved to Arizona when I was four years old. So when I started kindergarten, I still had an Irish accent. And I went public school, K through 12, right here in what's now Congressional District 1. And then I went to one of the best universities in the country and got a great job in one of the most cutthroat industries in the world. And that was all made possible because of the resources and community that I had right here in the district. So Congressional District 1 allowed my parents and me to really seek the American dream and achieve the American dream. My wife and I moved back here with our kids in 2020. They're all in public school as well. And when I look at my kids and I look at my kids' friends, I worry that they don't necessarily have the same opportunities that I had. And I feel like that American dream is starting to slip away. And so it's deeply personal to me to make sure that we beat David Schweikert. We've tried and failed two or three times in a row now. He's very beatable with the right nominee, and I believe I'm that nominee for the party. Your opponents might argue you've lived as an adult in the district for only two to three years. Do you understand CD1 as well as you now understand New York City, Manhattan? It's, it's a great question, Bram, but I've actually spent more time in Congressional District 1 than anywhere else in my entire life. So I think both from growing up here and now living here and as an adult, I have my finger on the pulse of the district. You know, we've run candidates twice in a row that did not live in the district. So, you know, I think the, you know, 15... But they didn't leave, years, live on the East Coast. They did not live on the East Coast. But the other reality is that most people in Arizona have spent time somewhere else. So I actually think the fact that I grew up here, I've lived here for several years now, but I also have that understanding of what it's like to live somewhere else and what it's like to be sort of an Arizona transplant in a sense, I think is something valuable for voters. Let's dig just a little deeper on your bio. You said, talk about a cutthroat industry. You're a Wall Street executive. What do you do? And, and are you working remotely? Uh, it's a great question. I am working remotely. So I've spent the bulk of my career in fixed income sales and trading. So I've worked in sales, I've worked in trading, both on the bond side, and I've also worked in investment banking. So since the pandemic, I've been able to do my Wall Street job from Arizona, and, and I joke sometimes that I have the best job on Wall Street because it's located in Scottsdale. Um, and so I run a group of fixed income sales executives, um, and we cover large institutional accounts all around the country. Now, you're quoted as saying the Democratic Party has put up candidates in the district who are, quote, too left. What made those candidates too left? So I think, again, if you look at the candidates we've run the last couple cycles, uh, first of all, they did not live in the district. And secondly, I would say that they ran on a bit of a boilerplate liberal platform, boilerplate talking points. And I think our district, you know, you asked before, do I really understand the district? Do I have my finger on the pulse? I think I absolutely do. And I'm not sure that our message resonated properly with the moderate Republicans and independents that you have to bring over in order to win this district. At the end of the day, it's still a lean 2.6% Republican district, so you have to build that coalition and you have to appeal to those voters, and I believe that I can. So which specific messages didn't resonate, do you think? I think it wasn't enough of a focus on the economy. So I think that for Democrats, independents, and Republicans, there's a huge focus on the economy in the district and, frankly, on taxes. I think people more or less vote with their pocketbook first in CD1, for better or for worse. So where would you put yourself on the on the spectrum, the Democratic spectrum? I think you were a Hillary Clinton supporter, and I, I believe a, a Bill Clinton, top Bill Clinton aide is your campaign chair. 
Uh, that's correct, yeah. So Justin Cooper is my campaign chair. He was one of Clinton's most senior aides, both in the White House and afterwards. So I, you know, I would, I would put myself in the mold of, of you know, the Clintons in terms of where I kind of fall on the political spectrum. Um, you know, so I don't know if AOC is a one and Trump's a hundred. I'm probably somewhere like thirty to forty on that spectrum. That's pretty close to AOC. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, let's talk about the economy. How would you grade President Biden's handling of the economy? A, B, C, or fail, and why? Great one. I think I, I would give him an A minus. I think that there's always room for improvement. But if you look at how the economy is done under Biden, Bidenomics is starting to work. And you know, I think that it, it was he, he inherited a, a rough deal from the previous guy, right? So I think it took a little bit of time to kind of get inflation under control, come out of COVID, and really get America humming again. But Joe Biden's been fighting for small businesses, which I think is something that's critically important to do here in CD1. So could it be better? It always could be better, but I think he's done a solid job. So this is one of the wealthiest districts in the state. Paradise Valley is one of the wealthiest communities uh, in the country. The Trump era tax cuts will expire during the next congressional term. Would you vote to extend them? So I think a lot can happen. So you're correct. They sunset in 2025. I think a lot can happen between now and 2025. Clearly, we've been in somewhat uncertain economic times with high inflation and you know coming out of COVID. So I'm not necessarily sure that rolling back tax cuts is the right thing to do. You know, depending on the state of the economy, if the economy is fragile, if we're still flirting with recession, I think that's something you'd have to look at very closely at that time. You know, I think if everything continues to trend in the right direction and we're humming along, then looking at letting them sunset is something we'd have to seriously consider as well. Does it bother you that a the wealthy benefited disproportionately? against those in lower income categories and it contributed in a big way to the national debt, to the growth of the national debt. Does that disturb you? Well, what disturbs me most about it is you have Representative Schweikert who starts to say, we got to cut back Social Security, we have to cut back Medicare because the national debt is getting so out of control. But meanwhile, he was one of the person, people that trumpeted the Trump tax cuts the most. So it's like he wants to have his cake and eat it too. To your point, he gave a tax cut to the wealthy, which naturally brings in less revenues for the government. So of course, you know, the deficit's going to balloon. So I think that's very opportunistic to say, well, hey, now that we have a bigger national debt, we need to pare back these programs that are so vital for millions of Arizonans. So that's actually what bothers me the most about it. Um, and I think it's something that has to be looked at given where we are much closer to those Trump tax cuts sunsetting. But you're not a no on extending them. Depending on the economic circumstances, I could see a, a rational justification for extending them if we were in you know, difficult economic times here in the country. All right. Let's run uh, quickly through the issues if we can. You said, you've said none of the issues really matter if we don't solve the water crisis. What specifically is the crisis? Well, I think the crisis is that if you look over the course of the next 50 or 100 years, you know, there's certain models that show Phoenix is having enough water, but I think we're definitely in trouble. We just saw, you know, the, the story up in the foothills here nearby us. There's communities around Arizona that are going to run out of water. So I think it's, it's a problem that needs federal coordination. There's so many different constituencies. You've got several different states. You have big cities. You have farmers. You have the Native American tribes. The reality is we all need water, and it doesn't work for anybody if we don't all have water. So it starts with things like Fondamonte. So we can't be letting you know, foreign governments come in, put a straw on the ground, suck up all the water, grow alfalfa, which, by the way, is illegal to grow in Saudi Arabia, and then ship it halfway around the world to feed their cattle. We can't afford to send Arizona's water outside of the state, much less halfway around the world to another desert. Uh, abortion. Arizona has a ban on abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Do you support that cutoff, or would you expand it to the Roe era 24 weeks? Yeah, so I think we need to do, I'm 100% pro-choice. And I think we need to do everything we can to get Roe v. Wade codified or at least get back closer to that standard. You know, as a lifelong Democrat, I'm disappointed that we've had opportunities to potentially do that in the past and haven't. Um, so it's something going forward that we need to do and we need to win this seat and win four others to take back the House and, and make progress on that front. Connor O'Callaghan, have to end it there. Thanks so much for joining us and best of luck. Thank you. Appreciate it, Bram.